is so wonderful to connect with you, Abby Purcell. Thank you, thank you so much for being a part of this new book, Life After Trauma. Oh, thank you, Andrea. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be a part of something like this. Thank you for inviting me into this world of sharing my story. Well, I'm, I was really grateful when you said yes, because the things that you have endured in the, in the space of just a couple of years, right, were, were exactly the reason why I put this book series together, is for people to know that even in our darkest times and our personal challenges in family relationships, um, we're stronger than we realize. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I was so honored when I met you over a year ago and I was sharing part of the story with you and I was like, where I really want to do something with this and be able to share and, and inspire and give hope to other people. And it was that connection with you that gave me the platform to be able to do this. So I thank you so much for this privilege. Oh, it's a mutual, mutual privilege, a mutual <laughs> honor. So I would love to get into this story that you share in Life After Trauma because um, I, I just love the way you open it. You open it by saying, if I were told 10 years ago about the challenges I would face as I turned 50, I would never have believed I would have had the strength and resilience to not only survive, but transform my pain and loss into hope and love. And your journey unfolds with a few weeks before your 50th birthday. So tell us a little bit about what was going on then. Well, I think too, you know, when I was younger, like in my thirties, you know, you kind of think, gosh, you know, when I'm in my forties, this is how my life is going to be. You have this, this dream. And then I was in my forties and, you know, things were going okay, but I was having some difficulties in my marriage at that point too. But that had been kind of, that's another story in itself. But I kept thinking, looking to the 50s, like, wow, what is this going to be like? You know, now I'm going to be 50 years old, which was just phenomenal to me. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And then it was right before, actually a couple of weeks before my 50th birthday, I um, began feeling really tired. And I was someone who has dealt with moderately little bits of depression throughout my life. So I thought maybe it was that because I could tell that my marriage was coming to an end around that time and it was really time for me to make a move and do something but um i just thought you know maybe it was just my normal being tired being overstressed doing too much so when i went to the gynecologist to find out what was going on with me um she just said that you had low thyroid and i said oh okay take a pill i'm gonna be fine i felt better everything was great um she said but however i would like you to see an endocrinologist in la so i thought no, I don't need to see him. I'm going to take this medicine. I'm going to be fine. Why do I want to drive to LA? But there was something in me that pulled me to go because there was something that said, Abby, eventually, you know, you, you, you know that you're going to be curious if you don't start to feel better, even though I was feeling better. I've always had this, maybe I should have checked that out deeper. So I did. And, um, he said, you know, everything looks good, but I think you're, you have what's called Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, and it's your own system attacking your thyroid. So I said, okay, he said, you know, I'd really like to do an MRI scan. So I said, okay, we'll do an MRI scan, look at the pituitary and then, you know, it'll be done. I'll be fine. So it was two weeks before my 50th birthday. And it was like, I thought, you know, I really, first I put it off and then I decided, no, you know, let's just get this done. So I went in, I had the MRI and then, um, I went off to um, the mountains with my family for my um, uh, 50th birthday party. And then when I returned and I got the results back from the MRI, they said that I had a brain tumor and I was just shocked. And then oh it was God. a cat of events that just kept happening. It's kind of like, you know, that game that you see at a carnival where the little beaver keeps popping up and you're trying to hit it down. It was like every time I got one down, one came up, one event, one, you know, and it just kind of exploded from there as the cascade of events that, that happened after that diagnosis. That is wild. I mean, I love how in, in the story, you know, as you're facing that, you, you found yourself like flat on the floor saying, okay, I finally get the courage 
to get out of this marriage. I'm going to, you know, look forward to the rest of my life and now a tumor. Like why God? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I will never forget that day that I laid there and just cried as I, at that point was packing up and leaving a home that we had had together and then dealing with this, this whole shock of having something growing in my hand that I had no idea at that point, whether it was cancerous or not. And then it was like, I felt like I just, like, as you just said, like I just felt like I was ready to just leap into a new world that I was so afraid to be on my own and to be this independent woman and walk away from a relationship that wasn't serving me. And now you're giving me this. It was like, I couldn't understand it. Like now, why now of all the times that this could have happened? So yeah, it was very gut-wrenching and frustrating and feeling like at that moment, there, where is the spirit, the divine? Like I felt like I was being punished or something. Um, but little did I know as this story unfolded, the gifts that I would acquire and the gifts that I would find out within myself, given all these challenges that came to me um, within that short period of time. Right. So I think that's like the, the mind blowing thing. It's being able to recognize there are some gifts in the most painful parts. And one of the things that, that came, you know, a couple years after, right, was you realized that your mom was needing a little more attention. Yes. Tell, tell me about that. So I had um, walked through a little bit of the, uh, for a couple of years, I had the brain tumor, had numerous scans, was monitoring it and trying to live with that, knowing and uh, not knowing what exactly what it was in my, in my brain that was, you know, cancerous or not. And then it was shortly, let's say I was die. It was about a year later. And um, my mother um, came to live with me in the desert where I was living. So I'd moved out of the home and my mom had come in to live with me. And I had gone to work one morning and usually I will call her. I left really early and she lived in a little casita outside of my house. So we had, she had her own little place and I would call her in the morning on the way to work because I wouldn't go in and disturb her in the morning. So when I called her, she first didn't answer. Then I called her back because I thought that was odd. She was doing, supposed to be doing something with my daughter that day. So then when I called her the second time, she picks up the phone and all I hear is mumbling. And I said, mom, what, what's happened? And she just kept mumbling. And you could hear in the mumble, there was a franticness, a scaredness. So I rushed back home, ran into her casita and found her laying there on her bed. Just the sadness in me just to just remember the fear that was in her eyes. Like, I don't even know what's happened to me. Oh so I my called God. Her and they came and we rushed her to the hospital and it ended up being a stroke. Um, my mom suffered from peripheral artery disease, and then she had AFib, which is an irregular heartbeat. So she um, suffered a massive stroke, which was a journey within itself because my mother and I were so close, and she was like my rock. And now all of a sudden she was brought down to, um, not in a, a, a childlike state because she was very, it's, it's amazing. And this is a gift of God because with the amount of brain loss that she had in her um, language area of her brain, she was still able to understand for the most part, everything you said, um, she could communicate in her own way. And that became a beautiful song and dance that she and I had because I, it was as if I, could speak her words. I knew what she was thinking. I was like her voice. So walking through that journey and then having her, you know, she's lived with me, but now it was a lot more of me taking care of her, working, dealing with my own internal um, feelings about the brain tumor and where my life was going. Um, it was a very challenging year and a half yeah. with her but also such a blessing to be able to be by her side and support her through mm. that and give her as much love as I could. Yeah, you wrote about such sweet tenderness and finding your ways to, to have little jokes and, and your own communication with her that, that just sounds so precious. But even then, <clears throat> I guess you guys were in a groove, your brain tumors not looking like it's gonna be all that crazy. And then you get this really, really terrible news that you had to deliver to your mother. 
Yes. Tell me about that. Um, so my brother, who was a couple years older than me, um, had struggled with heroin addiction probably since he was about 20. After a motorcycle accident, a friend of his introduced him to heroin to relieve the pain. And so my mother and father um, had really tried many rehabs and tried a lot of things to help him. And it just, to no avail, you know, the addiction got the best of him. And he was already, prior to mom even having the stroke, was dealing with um, heart failure. So when mom had the stroke, he was already in declined health. And I believed it was just a matter of time, as did my mother. But at this point, you know, with some of her cognitive ability gone, you know, she just didn't think that it was going to be as soon as it came. Um, so in the middle of the night, I uh, was awoken by a phone call from the police and asked if I had a brother named Pete. And I said, yes. And they said, I'm sorry to let you know that um, we have found him in his car on the side of the road. And my heart just dropped. Um, one, I knew this was coming and I felt, you know, a deep sadness and a deep, um, like anger that, um, you know, addiction has taken someone again in, yeah. in this world. And then how do I tell my mother who has spent her whole life trying to help him? Yeah. I don't know how much she's going to be able to understand, endure. I mean, even, even in her own process of her going through the stroke, she became frustrated with her own inabilities and her limitations that she was aware of. So she knew that she was impaired to some degree. So that was painful to watch. And now to watch her go through the emotions of losing her son. So she came in that morning. Um, this was like one in the morning. And then mom came into the house about seven. And I thought I just couldn't even sleep all night. I was thinking, how am I going to you know, share this? So I just took a deep breath and I sat down and I said, I have something I need to tell you. And then I wrote it down and I handed it to her. And because she was all happy, she thought I was gonna tell her about the day. And so I handed her this piece of paper because she understood when I paired it um, verbally and writtenly that she could actually then um, absorb it better. Yeah. So I told her and she just put her head down and we just sobbed and I just kept saying, I'm so, so sorry. And through that was a challenge to walk through my emotions of that and then walk through her emotions with her and help guide her, you know, in planning a funeral and gathering some people together. And that was just very difficult. And yet in some way, I often wonder if the stroke helped to alleviate a little bit of her pain, even though she had some, but um, was it some way just curbing it a little bit for her because um, I, I'm, you know, I always wonder that because I know how deeply she thought about his passing. Of course. And so it was interesting. Um, so yeah, that was another big challenge to walk through. Um, and again, I felt honored to be by her side and to be able to be a support to her. Um, and then it was just like the two of us left, you know? So it was, it was an interesting cascade, like I said, of events. Yeah. You know, I love that you have this perspective after coming through all of that, that you've, you know, you've told me before that you believe that we're really placed on this earth to experience the challenges of being human and that every interaction and even every disappointment, every joy, we're just being asked to go deeper and deeper within ourselves. Um, and that it's at those points that we can know true beauty, which again, I just, you know, my heart is so with you because I'm thinking if I were to endure so many things one after another, and then, you know, you still have this thing in your, your own brain, uh, you know, how do you not get just dark and depressed and just want to crawl under a rock? Yes, and there were days that I did probably want to do that. And, you know, it was like, I don't know, this is why I feel like, you know, the human spirit just carries us because as even you asked in the beginning of this interview, you know, how does one get through, when I looked at my 50s, did I think this was going to be a part of it? How, I had no idea. 
and the resilience of the human spirit that just carries you beyond your own knowledge. And you don't, I didn't even know it at the time. I felt like I was just barely paddling and keeping yeah. my head afloat. But there was something greater that kept pulling me that gave me strength to do this. I would have people come and visit um, and visit my mom and I. And, you know, they would say, I cannot believe how I couldn't do what you're doing, Abby. I couldn't. How do you know what she's going to say? How do you know how to navigate? It's almost like you're one. And it was like it wasn't until they said that that I realized wow, maybe I am doing something that's far beyond what I thought I could have done. To yeah. me, it felt so natural and something was actually just pulling me through it. Mm. So, um, That just gave I, me chills. I, I've got goosebumps. <sighs> Thank you. I, again, I just feel I can't um, say enough how honored I feel and felt to be there and to have that experience. Even in the darkest experience, I felt honored to be walking through that experience. Such wisdom. I mean, God, that may we all have that level of maturity and, and grace. That's so beautiful, Abby. And, you know, as you know, we, we just also published a book called Magic and Miracles. And you and I had talked about, you know, do we share your story in life after trauma? Or what about this miraculous thing that happened? So when your mother was ready to leave this world um you were actually at the hospital when you heard over the uh, the hospital loudspeakers um tell me a little bit about that and tell me about you know you're talking about this human spirit that carries us you literally had a physical experience of your mother's spirit right yes yes and that was miraculous and, and crazy within itself. You know, my mom and I, even ever since I was young, I used to say to her, you promise me when you go that you'll let me know that there's something beyond this. I said, you have to let me know, mom. You, you have to. And she would say, yes, yes. And so that morning, um, I called very early in the morning to the hospital to see how her night was. And it wasn't good. She was in a lot of pain. And the nurse had said that they had just given her another pain pill which concerned me because I remembered saying to them, don't give her the whole pill because it brings down her blood pressure. Can you only give her half? So when I asked the nurse, how much did you give her? She said, I gave her the whole pill. And I said, I am going to be there right now because that concerns me besides the morphine and the things that you're giving her, that is gonna put stress more on her heart. And the funny thing about my mother, she was such a jokester that she said when she um, dies or she gets to the point, all she wants, just give me the pill. Oh, give me a pill that will just put me to sleep. And I kind of, after hearing this, I put this all together that I said to my mother after she passed, you got the pill. Because I do believe she was in distress, but I think the pill was the thing that just let her lead her into her transition. Yeah. I walk into the hospital. I, you know, stop to get a juice. And I said, I, I'm going to be there all day. So I'm just going to get something to fuel me. So I go in and I, to the hospital. I walk in. I use the restroom, which is right down the hall, thinking, you know, I'm going to be in mom's room, so I'm just going to get everything done before I go there. So I went to the restroom, and I'm in the restroom, and I heard them say code blue in bed eight, and I didn't remember the actual bed number that mom was at, but I started counting because I could remember the rooms, and I went, oh my gosh, that's bed eight. And I just rushed down to the door. I lifted the phone and I said, look, this is Abby. And I'm calling for my mom, Harriet. And I just heard there's a code blue. And the woman said, you need to go down to the family room down the hall. And I remember putting down that phone on the little red, you know, hanger, the phone, the phone was red. And um, I walked down this hall, which was not very far. And I felt like it was miles. And I knew then that she was in distress and wasn't going to make it. And I just sat in that room by myself and just cried. And then a social worker came in and said, we're doing everything we can to do for your mom. And then she came back like, I don't know, 10 minutes later and said, I'm sorry, your mom passed. And I said, can I see her? And um, they said, yes. And so they, you know, cleaned her up and I went in about 10 minutes later and I had a friend that had come to me that was my mother's friend a family friend and she had walked in there with me and i looked at her and i touched her hair and i kissed her 
And then I bent down and I whispered to her, I know you're not of this world. I know that your spirit is gone. I know it's okay, mom, you can go. And with, as I bent down and I was lifting myself back up, I felt this like rush that just took my face and went like this. And it just went from the top crown of her head out through the, the wall of the um, room. And I just looked at the wall. And then I looked at my mom's friend. And then I just said, she's gone. Wow. And we walked out. I explained to her. And she was just like, oh, my gosh. She says, I remember you bending down and saying that to her. And it was like, I always believed that, you know, when you see like the movie Ghost and things like that, that the spirit would come from the heart up. Mm. But then after I learned um, and talked to some people about this experience, they said that normally the spirit will leave from the crown chakra from the top of the head. And it was like, it was so powerful. Wow. And at that moment, I knew that there was life beyond this. I knew that I was still connected to her. Um, in fact, after she was cremated, I carried her around in my car and we would just talk and I would just talk to her and say, well, we're driving to the desert, we're driving to San Diego, we're doing this. So, and she would just be there. And that was such a powerful experience for me that um, I'm so blessed. And I didn't realize either until later that, you know, eight was the sign of infinity and she was in the room of uh, infinity. That was another little another sign yes yes oh abby that is so so beautiful it's like the communication that you guys had over the years and these little signs and these little moments and then feeling the whoosh of her soul like mm -hmm. wow it's just it's awesome i'm i'm in awe well i know that you know now in in your work you're teaching yoga and kundalini yoga and, and mindfulness meditation have really become so much a part of your life and your ability to help others. Like you came from the world of special education, you were an educator, and now you're really helping people with this other side of education. Tell me about your work now. Well, um, I, which I love. I love um, teaching kundalini and kundalini um, truly saved my life before the brain surgery. And I'll just step back a little bit that uh, the month before I had the brain surgery, um, I found myself on a yoga mat in a yoga studio with a, a yoga called Kundalini that I had no idea what this was. And what I realized as I'm sitting there and I'm crying, I felt like I found my people, um, the chanting, the mantras, the love that was in that room. It was thought this is what's going to get me through that brain surgery. Yes. And I, knew at that point that there was no human on this planet that could guarantee me anything in life that I would be able to walk or talk after that surgery. And the only thing I could do was to connect to the divine and, and trust in that process. So Kundalini yoga has saved me in all these events that I'm speaking of with my mother, with my brother, with um, the brain surgery. And now, now it brings me into even more of this, connection with children and how all of our ner not all, a lot of us our nervous systems are really out of whack due to trauma mm -hmm. um not being any distressing disturbing event in your life from um a small thing to a large thing yeah. so my mission is to hold space for kids and to be able to help access more of the parasympathetic nervous system to help calm them. Um, a lot of the children right now that I'm working with come from gang related families and environments where they're under a lot of stress. So to bring in the mindfulness into the educational system and to be able to just have kids breathe and connect to breath and to be still for a moment and create a space and a container for kids to just feel not the pressures of academia or the system in which it, it, they are residing, but a space where they can just be who they are and get in touch with that. What am I? Who do, what do I feel? What do I do when I have anxiety? Um, and give them a little nuggets of tools that they can use in an environment that can just, you know, flare up their sympathetic nervous system to the point that they're not in touch with who they, with their bodies and their reality. So it's, 
it's beautiful because I know for me that through the, the events that I have gone through, you know, I was high, my nervous system was in high alert constantly and full of anxiety. Of course. And it's so important for your health and even your autoimmune system to be able to just calm this down and to find center, whatever that means for you. So that's what I'm doing now and hope to expand it and, and, you know, just help kids just to know how precious they are. And I think when we start really young yeah. then we're helping giving them the tools to be able to do it when they're older. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, such a gift you are, my friend. So, so beautiful. Such a gift. Oh, thank you. I am so in awe of you and I'm so grateful that you were courageous enough to share all of these aspects of your life and your process, your journey, as you say, as it's been unfolding. I really believe that people who read your story in this book um, are going to connect with such a powerful force that has been sustaining you and that sustains all of us. So thank you so much, Abby. Oh, thank you. And thank you for being the lovely spirit that you are that helps so many to be able to do this. So I so appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's part of my, my life dharma, as you will, uh, my life purpose. Well, my friends, I hope that you have enjoyed hearing a little bit about Abby Purcell's story. It is definitely one of the, the highlights of this book, Life After Trauma, and it proves that there are forces that we cannot see that are sustaining us, that we are stronger than we think, and that we can be even more resilient through all of these life challenges. So once again, Abby, I thank you so much for your contribution to this book. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Did you enjoy that interview? I sincerely hope so. Please support the authors by getting a copy of the book and click that like button, share this video with other people who need a little bit of positivity sprinkled into their life so that they know that, you know, we're all stronger than we even think that we are and we're never alone. There is a divine presence supporting us through all of our trauma and drama in this life. You can read all of the author bios and even get some free gifts from our participating authors. Just visit mylifererewritten.com. And if you or someone you know has a beautiful story to share of how you have overcome trauma and you are thriving and full of resilience, then check out our publishing options at makeyourmarkglobal.com. Until we meet again, my friend, please remember that you are a gift to the world. So share your presence with passion. Much love.